easy to write code to connect to a website, download the icon, do the hashing and everything, and run it against one site. But then you think, to make this really fast, I've got to parallelize it. And then you've got considerations like, what if the site has, requires SSL and things like that. All of that is built into NSE. You get the SSL for free, you get the parallelization for free, so it's really a good fit. We had to decide which hosts we're going to scan. There are some advantages to doing just random IP addresses because you'll get people's home cable modems and things like that, which are useful for fingerprinting. One problem with scanning IP addresses with HTTP is that you don't always have a host name, and sometimes that's required to access certain resources. So we decided against that, and we did a big survey of just the external links of some large web databases. So from the Open Directory project, we got about 5 million links. We took the four biggest Wikipedias and took all their external links. Obviously, there's going to be some overlap. We put it all together, and we had 8 million unique domains. Uh, an Nmap developer named Brandon Enright did all this scanning. As I recall, it took a few days. And in the end, we ended up with almost a million icons. About 80% of those were image files. About 20% of those were non-image files and error pages and things like that, which also can sometimes be useful for fingerprinting. Now, this is great. So we did all our results. We looked at the top 50 or so icons. We went and verified them manually. And we built a database, and that's what you get if you download Nmap now. You'll get a database of these top icons from this huge survey. But to me, it's sort of disappointing to do days of scanning and get gigs and gigs of data and end up with a 50-line data file. So we tried to think of something more creative to do with this. We ended up doing a second scan of the top 1 million web domains as published by Alexa. They publish their top million domains, and then they also publish a number that they call reach, which is just sort of a measure of how many people visit this site in a day or a week or whatever it is. And so we had the idea, we'll just get these icons, we'll pack them together into a graphic, into a visualization, make the size proportional to the reach, and just see what it looks like. So here we've got a small example, but I've got something even better. If you go to nmap.org slash favicon, if you're interested in exploring this data set and learning more about this scan, because there's a lot of interesting technical information, you can go to this website and we built this really nifty zoomer and scroller so you can kind of explore this picture. So let's take this and kind of zoom in on a portion of it. All right, so you can see you kind of scroll around and things like that, but what do we see here? This should be familiar to everyone in the audience. All right, let me apologize. Some of these icons are a little PG-13, but we've got uh, nmap.org here, some cute little Mario mushroom. We've got little tux penguins, so it's kind of fun just to browse around this and see everything that you can see. So I encourage you to kind of check it out. and. If you want to see a certain icon, if you suspect that your site may be in this top one million, there's a little lookup function. And it'll find it and zoom in on it, as if that was a hard icon to find, because obviously Wikipedia is one of the biggest sites on the net. All right, no examples right now. We don't have time for that. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is... Oh, so we like this graphic so much that we decided to turn it into a physical poster, which is what we have here. So here you've got the whole thing. You can see the big graphic. I mean, a lot of things stand out here. Google is easy to see, and things like Facebook and Yahoo and YouTube. But here's this, and we've got the top 70 sites identified and classified here. And just some further information about the scan. This is a really swank poster. It looks great in a living room. <laughs> Uh, there are only 15 of these posters in existence. This one happens to be signed and numbered, and we're going to give it away right now to whoever can win the icon identification contest. So real quick, someone near the front, hopefully, who wants to participate? Raise your hand. All right. I'm going to pull up an icon here, and you've got to tell me what website or project 
it belongs to. And don't yell it out. Yeah, the comma is supposed to be there. Okay, this icon right here. Do you know what that one is? You, you got it, all right. So here. Thanks very much. I'll bring this down here. I'll bring this down to you, and Fyodor's going to continue on talk about writing NSE scripts. Oh, the answer was OpenBSD. There you go. All right. Well, that was certainly a neat and creative way uh, to use the MMAP scripting engine. Can you guys still hear me? How about, how about now? All right, good deal, thanks. Um, so that was a nifty and creative way to use the MMAP scripting engine. But basically, in all three of these examples so far, what we've been talking about is how to use NSE and the scripts which come with it, which is certainly very valuable in and of itself. And most casual MMAP users will never go beyond using the scripts that come with NMAP. But let's be honest here. Any script kitty could do that. What happens if you, you're the network task you want to perform, we don't already have a script to do that? Or what if we have a script and it doesn't do exactly what you want it to? Well, this section is going to show you how to solve that problem and some of the benefits you can get by writing your own NSE scripts. And the good news is that even if you don't consider yourself a particularly great programmer, we've tried to make it as simple as we could to, to build these scripts so you can do it quickly, even for tasks that you may only want to do once or twice. So what we started with is a nifty little language called Lua. And it, I have the main book, Programming in Lua, here, uh, which is a great book. And it's a simple enough language that only the first 80 pages are you know, document all of the syntax and grammar of this language. And so I want to show you a very brief introduction to Lua and the reasons why we chose it. Like I said, it's very easy to learn. If you know other scripting languages like Perl or Python or even languages like C++, a lot of the syntax for looping and variable declaration and the like is very similar. It's tiny to embed. The book says that the complete distribution, source code, manual, plus binary for some platforms, all fits comfortably on a floppy disk. For those of the young people in the audience, a floppy disk is sort of... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's kind of between punch cards and flash drives in the technology range. Um, so being small is very important to us because we don't want to bloat NMAP downloads with some gigantic language. Also, it was important to us that it be widely known, used, and debugged. It was created in 1993 and still actively developed, so we knew it had a good track record that we're not going to start with some brand new language that then they're going to stop developing or, you know, give up on. It's best used, known for its use in the game industry with games like World of Warcraft and Crisis. But it's been taking a real strong foothold in the security community lately. Nmap can use it for NSE. Wireshark uh, can use it for its protocol dissectors. And Snort 3.0 uh, has a Lua interpreter. So by lear learning this one language, you can actually apply it to a range of popular security tools. One holdout from the Lua bandwagon is Metasploit, which is still in Ruby. But every time I see HD Moore at conferences like this, I talk his ear off on why he should change to Lua. I think that's why he's been avoiding me lately. A few other reasons. It's extensible. So instead of using Lua's default socket and networking code, we hooked it to NMAP's fast parallel networking libraries. It's safe and secure. Take the example of Wireshark with their protocol dissectors written in C. Yes, it solved the thing of allowing a lot of different users to contribute dissectors for an enormous number of protocols, but a huge number of them turned out to be insecure with bugs like buffer overflows and format string vulnerabilities and things that are specific to languages like C, where you do your own memory management. It's portable. Nmap, you may know we distribute binaries for Windows, for Mac, for Linux, and it works on the BSDs, on Solaris. And 
we needed a language that works on all of these machines too. There's even an Amiga port of Nmap for people who are into that. And Lua uh, works on all of the language, the platforms we wanted to support. It's also an interpreted language. So if you make a mistake in your code, you can just change, change it and rerun Nmap and you don't have to worry about a bunch of make file steps and compiling things. So that's Lua itself. Now we'll look at what NSE adds to Lua in order to make it more effective for network scanning. We have protocol and helper libraries. The idea is that we want Lua to be easy to use and so you can do things like make MSRPC queries and HTTP GET requests without getting bogged down in all the details of handling the specific protocol. So we have libraries for DNS, HTTP, MSRPC. We have a packet library for constructing raw packets, SNMP. Uh, David's going to talk about the username and password database a little later. Basically a bunch of scripts that are optimized for writing uh, network discovery tools. Uh, we have protocol brute forcers. One problem you sometimes have is you write a nice script that exercises a certain protocol on your target machine, but it requires a username and password. Well, with our brute forcers, you can more efficiently discover that username and password so that your script can continue. We have SSL, as David already mentioned, and we have a dependency system so that if we scan Microsoft and do SMB enum users, if we had done SNMB, SMB brute as well, it would have taken that user, it would make sure that the username script runs first and it would take those usernames and use them to brute force the passwords. So that's basically the nuts and bolts of what NSE is in terms of its infrastructure. I think now is a good time to get a little bit more concrete in things and actually look at the source code for an NSE script. The one we're going to look at is called RPC Info and it basically does what the name implies. People who've been doing pen tests for a long time have kind of become accustomed, I think we have, to basically you see the port 111 RPC bind open on the system and then in another window you do RPC info hyphen P target name to get the list of RPC uh, ports, services and port numbers available on that machine. Well, the feeling was wouldn't it be nice, even though that's not too much of a pain, when you have thousands or tens of thousands of machines, it is a pain. Wouldn't it be nice if Nmap, if it detects the port open, could automatically do that for you and place the results right next to that port 111 so you have everything together and convenient. And so let's look at how that script is implemented. And the great thing of these helper libraries is that this script, as you can see, is only 46 lines long, less than 50 lines uh, to give you all that information and that's because it's making use of our RPC helper script or library. So we have a description, basically says what the script is and that's for generating that NSE doc. Similarly, the output um, that the script does, as you can see, it basically looks like what you would get from the RPC info command. It has a few fields you have to give like the author, license, categories. This one's in discovery because it discovers more information and it's also in safe because it does a pretty standard function that the service was made to do. It requires a couple helper libraries, short port um, and more importantly RPC. And then we get to what's called the port rule. And basically it would be terribly efficient, inefficient if Nmap ran this RPC info against every single port that it finds open. It's going to do no good against web servers and most other services. It only works in very specific cases. And so with the port rule, you tell Nmap that the rule is if port 111 is open or if it's any port number and it's the RPC bind service detected by version detection and if it's the TCP or UDP protocol, this script can handle RPC bind on both. In that case, it tells Nmap, okay, this is a port that this script is interested in and so we run what's called the action function, which is right here. And the action function takes information on the host it's running against and the port it's running against. And here's really the key line here where we say rpc.helper.rpcinfo. This is basically our helper function for grabbing the RPC info. And we say if that failed, return an error message. And then this part is just a loop that